Hello listeners and, uh, uh, well, viewers, welcome to another vlog of the Free Marketeers. Uh, this is our second uh, try at, at bringing our show to you in a video format. Uh, and uh, we have some uh, giggles here just before we started. It's very uh, new to us, especially to see ourselves uh, in the laptop camera. But I think we're going to get used to it. And you listeners, you've indicated that you, uh, I think, mostly enjoyed this format more than our previous audio version. So yes, uh, uh, we've listened to you, and I think uh, uh, this will be a bit more interactive, uh, this video format. And yeah, I think we're, we're going to enjoy it. So um, We should do a VR experience in the future. <laughs> oh yes, yeah, virtual yeah. reality, that would be interesting. You can sit here with us and discuss uh, the issues facing South Africa. Uh, but yes, yeah, so as always, I'm Martin van Staden. I am joined by Chris Hatting and Mpiaki Dlamini. We all work here at the Free Market Foundation, as you can see very prominently behind us. Yeah. Um, and yeah, this week we have uh, five-ish topics, so some of them can probably be merged. But let's start with uh, the recent laws that President Ramaphosa signed into law, I think, yesterday and today. Uh, yesterday was the uh, National Credit Amendment Act, uh, which previously was a bill, but that, the way I understand it, I haven't studied the bill in any uh, type of detail, but the way I understand it is that um, if you earned under something like 7,500 yeah. rand a month, something along those lines, and something about 50,000 rand. I'm not sure, Biaki may have the details if, on if you have 50, uh, If you have more than 50,000 rands of uh, like short-term unsecured debts. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so what this, this bill, this act does was uh, relieve the debt, extinguish it, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, there's been a lot of opposition to the bill for good reason. Uh, so I think the Democratic Alliance and the banks especially, obviously, have said that if you do this, then we will stop lending money to lower income households. And I mean, that makes yeah. perfect sense because if you know as a lender, and I mean, not even to talk about micro lenders, if you know that you have no guarantee of getting your money back if you extend it to someone earning a little bit of money, uh, why would you even take the risk in the first place? So government is effectively now uh, pricing low income households out of the credit market. Yeah. Uh, now, Ampiaki, I think you have some more detail on this. I know you've done some reading about micro lending in South Africa yeah. quite recently. I don't know if you have some insight into this issue. Well, it's just, uh, it, it's, we already have a, a problem with, uh, with, with lending to poor people not being, uh, you can't price your debts according to the risk that you face mm -hmm. because of the National Credit Act. There's, mm -hmm. a, there's a cap on the interest that you can charge. So if someone is a, is, a, is, a, is a risky individual because maybe they don't have a stable job, they don't have a stable income, mm. you can't price that into your loan. So you, mm. you will tend to be more like less likely to uh, lend those people money anyway. Mm. And so this will just make exacerbate the situation uh, much, much, much more than it already is. Mm. So people will just tend to the... Uh, un, 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 unlicensed loan sharks, the machinists, they, they, they'll, they'll get more and more business. Yeah, black which market. Is, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So... So this is another thing. Governments can't actually kill markets. They can actually, they can only just drive them underground. Mm -hmm. They can't. So the black market will still exist. People will still be getting loans at like fifty percent, seventy five percent interest, or yeah. even hundred percent interest in yeah. some cases. No, so governments worry about, worried about exploitation, but <laughs> exactly. that's going to encourage more. Anyway, yeah. yeah, exactly. So you can, you, you can't. You, you can't extinguish market forces. You can only bring them into the lights. Make sure that everyone is treated fairly in, the, in any given transaction. So this, that's what's going to happen, unfortunately. Yeah, I mean, it's it's quite uh, shocking because now we have a, 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 an instance of government putting people in danger again. I mm. mean, it's the same story of prostitution and with drug dealing. The mm. whole, the, the, all the violence that we see in those industries, those black markets, is a direct result of the fact mm. that it's impossible for those people to conduct those perfectly voluntary affairs uh, above board. Yeah. So that's now going to be the same. Now people are going to go to these uh, loan sharks and mm -hmm. they're going to get their knees capped or mm -hmm. whatever, my mafiosos and whatever. So yeah, Chris, what's your uh, thoughts on this uh, new uh, so-called pro-poor policy <laughs> by government? Well, that's the language they use, isn't yes. it? It's always pro-poor, pro-fairness, yeah. pro-justice, pro-social justice, even though that's a contradiction in terms. Mm -hmm. This, this was obviously on a much bigger scale, but the 2008 financial crash, mm -hmm. you know, people like to blame Wall Street, the big banks, that mm -hmm. sort of thing. They don't realize before that how much pressure the U.S. government put on banks, mm -hmm. lenders, to lend to people whose credit score wasn't necessarily good, but mm -hmm. they're in so doing and government forcing them. 
that had a knock-on effect on credit, on that that bubble inflating and inflating even more and more. And we're going to see it in South Africa at some point. That I mean, not that we have a growing bubble, unfortunately, yeah. in South Africa and a growing economy, but now it's going to be much harder for poorer people to get yeah. loans and credit. And again, for all that talk about radical economic transformation, uh, bringing people into the fold, into the economy, um, you know, getting everyone on board, that sort of thing the president talks about creating however many jobs it is now. Um, I'm also losing track of, of that whole thing. Um, but for all that talk, they're adopting policies which go against their goals. So mm -hmm. this is this concept as well of the do-gooders, the mean-wellers. Yes. Uh, they want to lift people up, but they're, the problem is that they're using force to do it, and yes. they're using government force mm -hmm. to, to mm -hmm. dictate how people can move and live and make decisions. Mm -hmm. So it's going to have the very opposite yeah. effect, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I mean, uh, something that I think it's worth mentioning is that this has nothing to do with your credit score. So if you earn, you're a low income earner, mm. but you have a perfect credit score, mm. you've repaid all of your loans, you've never missed a payment, you are still out of luck as yeah. a result of this bill because mm. all the banks are now going to see and the all they're going to ask is how much do you earn? Yeah. It's under that amount, mm -hmm. automatic rejection, whether yeah. you've mm. repaid all your debt in the past or mm. not. So it's it's very much anti-poor. Yeah. It's, it's basically it's almost a direct yeah. and a very explicit attack on the poor. Yeah. And I mean that's that's very weird yeah. to me. In a in a assuming that these politicians understand what's happening with our economy, right. uh, f for them to do that. Yeah. Uh, and that, geez, it's. But I, I think I think maybe they just don't understand. But we are economics, right? No, but I mean, but we, we are yeah. white monopoly capital and that whole thing. <laughs> because so. I, I mean, the kind of things that they do, it's even if like you, you are the most stupidest person in the world, the who is who has the most amount of malice, it just doesn't make sense. I, I the only way you can it, it makes sense to me is if they really believe that they are doing good by mm. doing what they are doing now, even though there's a, there's so much evidence showing that yeah. it's actually the opposite. So they, I think they have, they have to believe what they're doing because otherwise it just doesn't make sense. I mean, this is this is another example of expropriation and probably yes. this is no. going to be one of the legal challenges to the to this law because it basically what it says is uh, people who had a contract to okay, I'm I'm giving you my property, then in future you are going to bring back my property, yes. mm. and then government says you don't have to bring back yeah. that, that property, yeah, yeah. and so that that's an expropriation. Mm. Yes, and so I hope I, I hope the courts rule. In mm -hmm. a pro liberty way on this, which is not guaranteed. Yeah, no, it's, <laughs> it's not guaranteed at all. But yeah, you make yeah. A, a great point. I mean, the credit that these banks extended, it's their property. Mm -hmm. They expect it back. And now government is in there. Mm -hmm. Well, you don't really have to do that. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it's an expropriation without compensation. Yeah. So. It, uh, to me, it's another example of a, a lazy way of trying to help people instead of doing the actual work yeah. of yeah. like policy reform and that sort of thing. It's mm -hmm. a very, I mean, I'm now speaking on the politician's behalf, but in a way trying to win votes by saying, we're canceling your debt. I mean, how wonderful are we <laughs> yeah. kind of thing? You know, why wouldn't you now vote for us in the future? But without considering the ripple effects of that yeah. in, in economics, I mean, in reality as well, you can't escape. You can try and escape the consequences of your actions, but only up to a point. Yes. It's going to catch up with you eventually. Yeah. And this is what, this is sort of kicking the can down the road. Yeah. Yeah. It's sort of the kind of thing when government keeps spending and borrowing without, um, and at any point cutting you know any element of that they mm -hmm. just keep on yeah. going more and more and more so we'll see it snowball i think eventually yeah, of course no, the weird nice. thing for me is okay we okay the fiscal situation is pretty bad but why didn't they just you know raise the taxes they need to pay off this this debt that these people owe i mean or, or even though that would have been not not a good idea right now it made more sense, yeah. but it would right. have been a better option than just stealing people's property without yeah. Yeah. Uh, anything yeah, bail out, yeah, exactly. bail out for the taxpayer, yeah. even though it would have been a bigger burden on the taxpayer, it would have been <laughs> far healthier for the economy yeah. in the long run. Mm. I mean, this is basically just an attack on people's right to have credit. Yeah. Mm. It's excluded them entirely from the credit market. Yeah. But I suppose you can make the same argument with the NHI. I mean, you could have, why don't they just raise the taxes and provide the level of credit yes. mm -hmm. that yeah. they want to provide? Yeah. But yeah. Girl, it's, it's just, I, this is what we're talking about. None of this makes sense. Yeah. No. Yeah, and I mean, minimum wage prices people out of the labor market. Exactly. So there's this new thing where government is price, pricing poor people out of the credit market, the labor yeah. market, the health market. I mean, goodness me, geez. Uh, I know that government wants people to, to be dependent on the state, mm -hmm. but why take away their access to credit? It's almost totally unexplainable. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think the, the surprise that we all have doesn't come from the fact that uh, 
uh, the, the particular ruling party that we have now is implementing these kinds of policies. Of course, they, they see themselves as uh, pro poor, mm -hmm. so they would do this. Mm -hmm. I think the surprise is just the sheer volume because they didn't, we didn't have this kind of volume before of bad ideas. Right. Right? We would have like maybe one thing once a year that we would mm -hmm. all fight yeah. over. No. But now all of a sudden we have just this yeah, it avalanche started, of things. It started in December 2017. Yeah, I wonder the, what happened there. Yeah. <laughs> no. Interesting, yeah. something changed. Yeah, it's a mystery. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's changed. because the Springboks are winning again, so they think right. they can sneak things in now. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Everyone's focused on the sports yeah, team. Yeah, we're so, doing yeah. too well. We need to... <laughs> But yeah, so uh, we said we're going to talk about two laws. The other one that the president signed into law today, I believe, is the uh, ARTO Act. So I think that is the Administrative Adjudication of Road Traffic Offenses Act. Yeah, I'm too impressed you got that. Yes. <laughs> well, as a lawyer, with yeah. all these yeah. terms, he yeah. gets very yeah. excited. So I studied for four years well. for a reason, by the way. <laughs> uh, so um, the ARTO Act, uh, it's various things relating to traffic law, but I think the most uh, interesting new introduction into the South African law is um, the, demer the demerit system. Uh, so the Australians, I think the Canadians may have this. This is basically where if you start with a certain amount of points on your license. And as you break traffic rules, you get points deducted from your license. Mm -hmm. And if that reaches some number, then your license gets suspended and uh, etc. You need to pay fines. And then eventually your license can actually be canceled mm -hmm. because you're deemed to not be a roadworthy person. Um, but so I think most South Africans in principle understand that we have a road the recklessness yeah, problem. Right. And I think in general, the points based system is not in and of itself mm. terrible. Mm -hmm. The thing is that that I think the most of the, the objections to this thing is uh, to this act that is now a law is based on is the way that government is sneaking ethos into mm. it. So as you're familiar with yours, um, ethos is the, uh, there, there is a, lo uh, a long name, but it's the uh, big gantries in Gauteng on our, um, on our highways mm. whereby you uh, drive through it and then you get an amount uh, deducted to your account or something. And, sorry, uh, yeah. isn't everyone in, in the other provinces, they're also paying for a drive? Uh, ethos? Isn't the country subsidizing ethos? I, I'm not sure, but they, they pay taxes. And I mean, that's the big <laughs> argument against ethos is we've been paying taxes yeah. for these roads and we yeah. didn't ask for the, this new tax. But anyway, it's like, um, and most people have, I think I think most people have opted not to pay these mm. things. It's been a very uh, successful civil, di mm. civil disobedience campaign. Mm. Um, and I think, I mean, the trade unions are against ETOs. The Communist Party is against ETOs. The ANC in Gauteng, which mm. introduced it, is against ETOs. <laughs> Um, everyone is against ETOs, yet now uh, they're doing this. So what, what is going to happen now is if you do not pay your ETOs, mm. uh, you'll have points deducted from your license yeah. because you're committing a road traffic violation by not adhering to road signage. And ETOs are considered road signage, okay. apparently. Um, so this means if you persist in not paying your ETOs, you're going to be, be unable to renew your license or they'll cancel your license. Mm. You can't drive anymore. So... Yeah, I mean, I am known for being very much anti-traffic law. <laughs> I think that there's only one rule of the road, don't drive recklessly. Mm -hmm. um, I know it's a minority view, but Chris, uh, what do you think about this new introduction into our uh, traffic law regime? Do you think it's going to be applied fairly? Well, again, okay, no, I don't think it's going to be applied fairly. It's yeah. that issue of when you increase government power, it increases the chance of abuse mm -hmm. and corruption and state capture, all the stuff that yeah, South yeah. Africans are so worried about. And we <sighs> listen to on the radio and on TV and, you know, the revelations at the different commissions, everyone gets very upset. There are newspaper columns, yeah. like, are day after day dedicated to this stuff. But we don't fix the root of the problem. Yes. So we shouldn't be surprised when it, again, in 10, 20 years, blows up, you know, if it's bigger than mm -hmm. the previous scandals kind yeah. of thing. Uh, just in terms of practicality, uh, that notion again of the seen and the unseen and the consequences of government policies, this sort of thing will then force people off the highways, yeah. onto back roads, that kind of thing. It's yes. going to put the pressure on those roads, mm -hmm. increase the costs of fixing those, ro ro those roads. We know most, yeah, most of the roads in the suburbs in Gauteng are fine, yeah. not too many potholes, but this will increase that, yeah. especially with trucks, that sort of yes. thing, and increase the amount of traffic on the back roads. Um, I don't think it's going to result in the collection increases that they foresee that they want mm -hmm. to pay for the stuff. Uh, people are going to find other ways to get around it. Yeah. And then this on top of the carbon tax, mm -hmm. it's discouraging people from using, you know, their own transport, yeah. from being independent. 
in some way, maybe they'll at, at another point increase the amount of buses or trains or, or try to fix those yeah. services so that we become again more dependent on state services. Yes. It's sort of uh, in a long term roundabout way pooling people to rely on the state more yeah. and more. Even though the state is totally incompetent. Oh, well, yeah. that's okay. At least it will be equal. Yes, no, <laughs> so, yeah. equally disadvantaged. Yeah. Yeah. So that's just yeah. my broad take on it. I think yeah. it's misguided, um, as a lot of big government policies are. Yeah. And I don't think it's going to have... Yeah, it's they're they're probably not even, not even aware of what it, what they want what they want in terms of effects and consequences. I don't know what they what their explicit goal is with this, but that tends to happen when you grab here and there and you try and use this thing to justify that thing. You don't have an overall strategy for fixing problems, so you just create more yeah. as you go. Well, the the overall strategy I think is uh, it's part of the uh, government's international obligations as far as uh, environmental sustainability goes. Oh. So they want to make it more expensive for people to use roads on their own. Yeah. So they want to encourage people to use how train. I mean, you mentioned it, public mm. transport. Mm. But the thing is, it's done in such a way that, and and I often make this. Uh, this analogy for some, or I don't know if it's an analogy, but our government thinks it's governing Sweden. Right. They think that, no, but uh, of course, why don't you use public transport? Mm. I mean, it's uh, they do it in Hong Kong, mm -hmm. they do it in New York, it's great. Mm. It's like, guys, mm. people get stabbed on our trains mm. every yeah. single day and yeah. killed. People get rolled to death in taxis. Mm. You cannot use public transport in South Africa like you would in any other yeah. Western country. Yeah. Or even some African yeah. countries have far better yeah. public transport or trustworthy yeah. than ours. Yeah. And our government doesn't seem to get it. Yeah. Uh, Biaki, I don't know whether you have insight on, on this. <laughs> I'm just... I'm just surprised that they are doing so many stupid things about this fight. <laughs> Don't be surprised, man. You're no, a libertarian. Come on. <laughs> look, look, look. I mean, uh, yes, we used to, but it just seems out of the, the it's so out of the blue in many mm. ways. For example, like, I mean, don't they understand? That's the more you make it, uh, you make the life difficult for people. Mm. Let's say, for example, okay, you may you you put up an e-toll gantry in Gauteng, mm. people ignore it, and then you force them to pay the pain of losing their license. Mm. Does no one in government think that maybe people might just say, okay, I'm done with Gauteng, I'm going to move somewhere <laughs> yeah. else mm -hmm. since I can't drive here. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, they they only in in their minds there can only be two options: either people start using the how train or they pay. Right. They don't. They don't consider that people have options. They can yes. move overseas. They can no. move to other provinces. No. As many people have. Them no, there, exactly. Yeah. There's that concept of water or oh. sand. The harder you try and hold onto it, the more slips mm. through your fingers. Yeah. So they want more to collect more taxes and stuff, but they're doing it in a very yeah. uh, back to front kind of way. They're not incentivizing people to stay, yeah. to contribute, to be part of the society, yeah. for it to be built organically. They're doing it very top down, yeah. and they're just forcing more and more people to leave. So we shouldn't be surprised when. Every year, SARS says the the tax shortfall is going to be bigger than the previous year. The, I don't know where they're going to fund stuff. The whole, whole the whole point of what's it, the Laffer curve? Yeah. The whole point of them developing that concept was to help governments mm. and say, yeah. "Hey guys, we know you want to maximize, uh, yeah. maximize your uh, your revenue from taxes. We totally support you to do that." Just make sure on this point you don't go over, over that because then you'll start collecting less. Yeah. The Laffer curve is not anti-government pro-free market. It says government, if you want to maximize your money, this is mm. what you do. But suddenly mm. or somehow a government is actively undermining itself. Yes. Now, to an, as a libertarian to an extent, I'm like, yeah, please <laughs> just go ahead. Please do more. But it's it, it, it's undermining itself in such a way that it's it's literally collapsing the economy yeah. like slowly. Biaki, I saw you draw it. I hope people can see. It's closer there. <laughs> this is the this is the Lafa curve. So you can see that uh, as your as 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 the as the as as the taxes as the tax rate increases, there's a point where you get to the peak. So this mm. this is the the amount of taxes the government actually collects. So you get to a peak, and then the, any increase above that just leads to less and less taxes being yeah. collected. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, I mean it makes concept. sense. Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. I mean, if you if 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 the tax burden increases, then you you are incentivized to find try and find a way to yes, and uh, dodge it somehow. And we've know? been over the Africa. <laughs> we're we're over it. Yeah. The government has been collecting less and less tax yeah. revenue for mm. I don't know how many of since, the last since years. at least two thousand and six, two thousand and seven, the financial year. Two thousand and six, not sixteen. Yeah. Two thousand and six. This was during Mbeki's year. Yeah. yeah. This is a more than a decade oh, ago. Yeah, We've been so, over yeah. the Lafra curve. So yeah, it's <laughs> it's totally ridiculous. Mm. And I mean, uh, the fines, fees, levies, these are all taxes. Mm. So don't get confused by our use of the word taxes. Any 
involuntary extraction from the citizenry is perceived, at least subjectively, by everyone who has to pay it as a tax. Are we going to debate whether taxation is theft? Well, it's not up for debate. It is theft. <laughs> so uh, let's, let's not even go there. Um, but okay, so that brings us to our third topic. And uh, this is basically something that the government has been doing for a while, but it's gotten very explicit in the last few days. And that is politicians and specifically the president saying, we will do this, mm. whatever this is, he said it for the NHI, mm. um, we will do this whether you like it or not. And funny enough, he also said, we will grow the economy whether you like it or not, which is <laughs> bonkers and absurd. As if, any, gonna, no. as if someone has been saying, no, geez, we, we must not grow the economy. That's <laughs> terrible. Please stop. But yes, he also said that. But like, as someone uh, who takes constitutionalism, mm. the rule of law very seriously, and well, democracy. I'm not mm. a big Democrat, but like democracy in the context of a constitutional a democracy. Small D Democrat. Yes. Not a, uh, I don't think you're a big D no, Democrat. No, no. <laughs> uh, but but in the context of that, some uh, 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 a president of a country that has been a democracy only for 25 years. It's a young democracy, mm. and he's supposedly from the organization that brought about brought about that democracy. Uh, let's just take uh, him. So, sorry, you yeah, just yeah, to cancel this. <laughs> and put it on silent. Yeah, quick, yeah, uh, yeah, you can continue. Uh, for, for, um, for a president of a, a young democracy and part of an organization who supposedly brought that democracy to, to this country, to say that whatever you as citizens want, we do not care because we're just going to do what we want, uh, whether the public participation process reflects what we want or not. So, I mean, the Etoys one is the best example I can think of. No. Nobody supported Etoys. Nobody supported Etoys, yet they did it. Uh, with NHI, there is an, a massive amount of organizations saying, and I mean individuals who are socialists are saying, we no. cannot afford this. And the government is saying, screw you, we're going to do it. Mm. Uh, and the credit thing they did uh, very quickly. And yeah, I mean, this is bizarre. What, mm. what do you guys have to say? about uh, the democratic credentials uh, of our government right now it's uh, it's, it's well okay if it, if it was a demo uh, it, it is it, it's been voted in the government has been voted in mm. so I suppose I mean I, you guys know that I'm, I, I don't think much of democracy in in the first place mm. because I think like it's um, why, why would you uh, why would you leave something as important as governance, rule of law, and all of those things to a popular vote? Right. I mean, we've seen popular votes. I've, I watch idols. And I know what's <laughs> happening. Popular votes. <laughs> why, would, why would you take something that seriously and, and put it up to something yeah. like that? Mm. It doesn't make sense to me. And so I, 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 it seems like the, the, the president is really uh, trying to make a point to his enemies that, uh, oh, he's trying to too hard to, to seem to be not weak. Right. So he's trying to project strength yeah, by doing, exactly. Yeah. yeah, and and by doing that, he's actually choosing the worst ways to show it. Mm. If you want to show strength, stand up against EWC. If you mm. want to show how strength, stand up against the NHI. Mm. Stand up against the massive amounts of regulations, which is it's yeah. actually quite shocking how many yeah, regulations exactly. are there. But anyway, if you if you want to show how strong you are, stand up against the things that would that make South Africans poorer, that makes South Africans less the, the less well off. Mm. But actually, Martin, I also wanted to ask you a, a, a question, but I forgot in the previous one we were talking about Arto. Mm. Uh, do you think do you think this uh, this act is a is a power grab by Parliament against the judiciary? Like in the sense that they they are making hmm. uh, road road offences now being adjudicated administratively instead of whereas before hmm. you could go to court. Yeah, so I mean that that happens uh, around the world and it has been happening since the rise of the so-called administrative state hmm. in the last century. Hmm. Uh, but yeah, that that's it. But it's it's not really parliament; it's the executive yeah, because right. they created an, an executive tribunal. I don't know what they call it. The, uh, appeals tribunal for road traffic offences or something like sure that. Not the Politburo. Yeah, well, basically, <laughs> yes. And so Parliament does these things, but it does it on behalf of the oh, executive. No, that's the right. NPC. Oh, all yeah, right. Then. Uh, yeah. So, so yes, I think that's definitely it. So the the jurisdiction of the courts has been ousted in the in road traffic uh, if, uh, term uh, matters, but not totally. So if you fail on the appeals tribunal, you can still take that on review to court. Mm. Uh, but the court is no longer your first. So, stop of first instance, your uh, first resort. Yeah. Um, but yeah, this is something that has been happening and it's absolutely a paragraph from the judiciary because it's uh, the judiciary as a general rule. Now it's some shaky uh, 
uh, grounds for me saying this. It does not enforce ideology. It, mm-hmm. it listens to the grounds of the two parties before it, and it adjudicates on the facts uh, what mm-hmm. the law says. But uh, uh, increasingly, our judiciary is becoming very keen on ideology, but still there is a, a healthy tension between government yeah. and yeah. judiciary, and government obviously doesn't like that. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it has, it, this is definitely part of that. Mm-hmm. You see that in, in many pieces of legislation nowadays. So why, why isn't the judiciary fighting back and saying, okay, no, this is actually our constitutional powers, you can't take them? Well, <laughs> the judiciary, uh, there's a long debate in, in uh, legal philosophy and so forth, but like the judiciary doesn't have its own enforcement mechanism, it's unelected, yeah. so it has no constituency. Um, and uh, when the judiciary in history has tried to fight back, it has always lost. So mm. uh, in America in the 1930s, the judiciary struck down a lot of New Deal legislation of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Mm. And then he basically said, that's nice, I'm going to uh, back the court. And they had the constitutional authority to do that. Uh, and when he threatened to do that, the judiciary backed down. And uh, okay. there's an understanding now that they won't push too hard. And in South Africa in the 1950s, uh, the, ju- ju- the judiciary pushed back against the apartheid government when it tried to disenfranchise mm. co- colored. Mm. Um, and uh, the, ju- the government did threaten to pack the court, but in this case, it actually did pack the court, mm. 5 to 11, and then uh, packed it with its own supporters mm. and thereby nullified the, mm. the voice of the court. So, unfortunately, the cards are always stacked against the, ju- the judiciary. It's the weakest branch of government. So, basically, they, 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 this, the idea that's of co-equal three branches is, no, no, is, is completely false. Yeah, it's a fiction. <laughs> Only an idea. Yeah. It's a fiction, unfortunately. <laughs> Um, and yeah, I think the last topic before we have a short announcement is uh, police corruption. Now, uh, mm-hmm. we wanted to talk about this last week, but uh, the NHI was such a surprise to all of us that we really had to dedicate uh, most of that episode to that yeah. terrible piece of legislation. Um, but there was an announcement or a report by uh, an organization uh, last week that uh, South Africans who have been surveyed indicated that the South African police service is one of the most corrupt institutions in the country. Now, this is not objective fact, this is a perception mm-hmm. index. So what do you perceive to be one of the most per- uh, corrupt institutions in the country? And it's the police. And uh, I think everyone, uh, the first thing that came to our mind was, uh, this is the same organization, the police, that uh, is currently trying to disarm civilians. Uh, so we have insane amounts of violent crime in this country. We have a citizenry who does not trust the police mm. whatsoever, and that same police is saying, let's disarm the citizenry. I mean, this is uh, a recipe for disaster. Yeah. I mean, Chris, what do you, uh, what's your take on this whole thing? So this and the previous topic, um, from a broader, I guess, ideological and philosophical point of view, it's highly concerning how how the government is acting um, in its view that it can, you know, act without anyone's yeah. with. It's like it doesn't see itself as our servant anymore. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely now we are its servants. We're yeah. sort of tenants on its land kind of thing with EWC, yeah. with yes. NHI. We have to go to it for mm-hmm. healthcare services, that sort of thing. And with this, to on the one hand, haven't a few people from the police service themselves acknowledged the problems and yeah. that whole thing? And But on the, on the other hand, they still want to take away a citizens' ability to arm themselves. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So you um, do you want your citizens to be disarmed and vulnerable yeah. to crime and criminals and, and thuggery? Mm-hmm. Or do you want them to be dignified, independent, responsible individuals who can take care of themselves and their families? Definitely. What is, well, right. Yeah. Yeah. So what, you know, what is your view of the people you are governing? Uh, um, not just the, the current party and the majority, but all the political parties. Yeah. Do you... Do you think nothing of the struggle against apartheid and colonialism, you know, which were struggles against state oppression against certain race groups? Do yeah. you think that now, because it's a, a democratically elected majority government, it has the authority to take away individual rights and people's ability to protect themselves? Do you? To me, it's a, it's spitting on the sacrifices and the, the what what came before, what yeah. people struggled against yeah. for centuries, um, and it's undoing what good work has been done. Of course, we know South Africa isn't perfect, no. um, but we sort of, we were on, a, on an upward tra- trajectory of freedom, and now we're going back down to more and more authoritarian control. Mm-hmm. I mean, call it what you want, socialism, statism. Yeah. It's all the states above the individual, yeah. Yeah. that idea. So this is just another example of that with the police corruption, disarming citizens, um, and people need to, to raise awareness of it and Absolutely. fight back because, I mean, we're seeing in Hong Kong now mm-hmm. uh, what's going on there and again with apartheid and in America as well with slavery, 
um, if people are able to defend themselves, government is going to be much more careful yeah, about yes. what it comes in and tries to do. You, uh, They're much more wary of how they're going to try and take away your rights and your property and that kind of thing if you're yeah. armed. So this is something I think we need to hammer a lot. Yeah, uh, yeah. The, 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 some of the first actions that both the American and South African colonial governments yeah. took was to disarm natives. Mm, yeah. uh, the Hitler disarmed the Jews, one of the first things yeah. he did. Yeah. I mean, it's not just a coincidence. Mm, it's, yeah. it's, a, it's a formula. Mm. The moment you take a decision to help people, mm. but you know that they aren't at, in the end. At the end of the day, they're not going to want that help. No. The first thing you do is you take away their no. guns. No. Uh, so yeah, it's it's a formula no. that's kept on re reappearing throughout history. Um, yeah, please don't think this is a hyperbole view. This no. is just um, the the premises follow one after the other. It's yeah. just once you remove certain blockades to tyranny eventually you're going to get full-blown tyranny. So we're not saying like this is overnight kind yeah, of thing, no, no. Which but is, it's a progressive, yeah. Which is why uh, gun ownership is, is such a fundamental part of uh, liberty itself. That's why uh, like so many of us who don't own, own guns re realize how important it is to fight for gun, gun rights. Mm. Because it's like you said, it's almost like a formula it's, and it's uncanny. You, yeah. you see the same thing happening over and over again. I think what is new now is that we've seen a lot of... Uh, European countries uh, restrict gun ownership and even confiscate guns mm. without going that extra step. Mm. But otherwise, that's that's the exception that proves the rule. Mm. Because every in every other case, gun confiscations always always lead to something else. Yeah. And so, like for example, you saw it here in South Africa, where uh, where wh what people don't know that one of the first things that uh, one of the first rights that uh, black people lost in South Africa after after they had lost the the, the wars against the, the British and the Africaners was the right to own firearms mm. because they had before pre previous to that they had been trading with the, the Portuguese, the English and the Africanized themselves mm. in getting guns. And then all of a sudden, as soon as they, they lost all these wars, they, their ability to own guns was restricted. No. I mean, there's a reason for that. No. And so this is, I, I think South Africans should be aware of this. Mm. And on your point, Chris, about the disdain that politicians feel for us. Mm. And I think I think there's, a, there's actually a very good or a broader point there is that it's not just the politicians, it's the trade unions, it's the right. corporates. Because I see, like, it, to me, it's still a shock, sorry to talk about the NHI again, that no. you, can have, you can have medical aids, which we are the customers, mm. like they're supposed to be pleasing us, mm. but then they are saying, they're going to government and saying, okay, no, it's fine if you text these people. It's yes. fine. They, there's nothing wrong with it. No. They, as long as you... you, 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 you you still allow you still uh, leave leave space for them to still pay us their, mm. their medical aid mm. premiums mm. As, as long as as long as you don't ban that in law mm. and you, you can text them as much as you want and we can't do anything about it because that's the, that's the crazy thing mm. it just shows that we don't really live we live in a crony society i believe yeah. I, I i mean for the fact that companies are can can call for more taxes on their own customers is crazy mm. to me mm. but those companies shouldn't be getting any customers we should be switching to other uh, small uh, small business options or whatever, yeah, but we yeah. don't have those options because of such a cronyist society. Yeah. We have this wall of regulation that does everything possible to to keep out small uh, small business started mostly by poor people yeah. from making it. Mm. It's, it's it's just it's sad and it's crazy at the yeah. same time. And it's uh, and what's even more crazy is that so few people realize what's going on. Mm -hmm. What is going on in South Africa now and all the examples yes. we've talked about and what we talk about every week, it to me reinforces this idea that I've been thinking about for the past sort of week or two, that socialism and statism, they're very much um, ideologies of the elite, yeah, of the yeah, elite no, no. classes. Um, I don't think, I mean, you know, speaking on behalf of, of other people here, you know, psychologically, that kind of thing, but I like to think that individuals want to lift themselves up. They don't want to have to wait for someone to come knocking on their door and do stuff for them. But these these ideologies, they're very much top down yeah. and they think we're going to do these things for you. And in so doing, they remove people's dignity. But they're very much the purview of the politicians, the bureaucrats, the elites, the big corporates who can afford to with these taxes and things. But again, poor black South Africans are going to be the most affected by these things. They don't have an option to yeah. leave. When the NHI comes in and the healthcare crashes, People can go to Singapore, like the president of the former president of the country north of us. Yeah. He can go to Singapore for his healthcare because he destroyed his own country, yeah. and the same will happen here. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I was about to say, uh, people often say that uh, America's original sin was slavery. Well, 
uh, Marxism's original sin was the fact that it was started by two bourgeoisie <laughs> members of the bourgeoisie. Yeah, so, European white guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Way. No, they, 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 were, they were so far from being lower class. So to your point, Chris, about these things we are being middle class or upper class things, it, it's, it has always been the case. Mm. There was no proletariat revolution starting from the proletariat themselves. Mm. It has always started from these people who know better, who have more money. If things, the people who work for when if things get really, really bad, they can always run away. No. And I think uh, you, there are only a few people who are intellectually honest enough to admit that people like George Orwell, who himself uh, was part of the bourgeoisie, mm-hmm. was a communist, but no. then he realized how how stupid it all, it all was and, and spent the rest of his life attacking this idea. No. And so I, I it's, uh, in South Africa, for example, uh, a friend of mine, uh, I don't know if the video has been released yet, uh, a friend of our, a common friend of ours uh, mm-hmm. did a video where he was interviewing people in the streets, just ordinary people who are getting conversing their views about the NHI. Mm-hmm. And he was telling me that, like he was, he, he himself, he, he even himself was surprised because so many people were against it. <laughs> even people that you, you would think, okay, no, this guy doesn't look like maybe he has a job, maybe he, he's for no. anything government, but mm-hmm. no. People realize what this is. People yeah. are, are wake up every day and go to work precisely because they are trying to escape government. Yeah. And government yeah. is keeps imposing exactly. itself on yeah. their lives, which is I don't I don't understand it. I mean, the problem uh, the problem is that we that have led to South Africa to this point. Uh, where are you talking about apartheid colonialism? And the problem there was that it, it, it was big government. I mean, race was almost a sideshow. Sure. The problem was the big government, and we, we keep perpetuating this problem that has caused all our other problems. Mm. And I think we uh, somehow we think it's going to lead to solutions now. Somehow I don't know how, right. but it's it seems completely crazy. And I don't like I, I'm 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 honestly at a loss right now. I don't know what to what to think when I see all of these things because it's so. It's so crazy, but it's happening. Yeah, <laughs> yeah well, we, we got to oppose it. I mean, uh, there is there is no one else. Uh, we, we need to fight that battle. Mm. Um, and uh, I think a good point you make about uh, Marx and the uh, point about these people coming from uh, the, the upper classes. Mm. I mean, there's this global rise of populism yeah. right now, right, a distinctively reactionary right-wing, mm. if you will, populism, mm. which people are now saying is actually coming from the lower classes. But... Actually not, no. though. <laughs> I mean, Donald Trump is not a lower class person. If no. it was a revolution of the no. lower class, a person from the lower classes would have been elected president of the United States. And it's not just a coincidence, uh, a cosmic coincidence that he happens to be one of the richest man, men in the country. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and this is the case in Europe where this is happening as well. Yeah. These are politicians, aristocrats, yeah. basically. Uh, who are now suddenly men of the people. <laughs> no. uh, so, I mean, the, the message to so, get... Sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt, Martin, sure. but I did, it's just a, a story that's too good to share. In the, the Five Star Movement in Italy, the person who actually bankrolled the entire thing was was a guy who was an early... Uh, who was into the internet boom early on, made a lot of money. Mm. So you are absolutely right. It's all these rich people. Yeah. In the UK, Nigel Farage, another rich guy, yeah, yeah. Uh, Jacob Rees-Mogg. No, it's, you know? it's, it's, it's almost without exception. And, 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 yeah. and I mean, the, the message to get from this is no matter how libertarian you think you are or how enlightened mm. and aware you think you are of what's happening, mm. it seems that all of us have have that point where some guy comes no. about, almost invariably a rich guy, mm. maybe like a mm. new mayor of a big, a big South African city, mm-hmm. and uh, he says, uh, I'm here to help, and no. I'm, I'm, I'm enlightened, and I'm yeah. your I'm your guy, I'm on your side, it's us against the world, and then that, it, it grabs our imagination, and we no. immediately fall in with it, and suddenly we have this massive blind spot, I and mean, we see this in America, see it in Europe, we see it in South Africa, the message that I really incessantly try to push is stop thinking in terms of leadership. Mm, yeah. Stop uh, writing my leader on Facebook when you no. talk to someone. I mean, it's a small thing, but it, yeah. it reinforces... It's a psychological indication. Yeah. No, no. You, you do not have leaders. Mm. Do, do not see yourself no. as having leaders. Mm. You are a free, sovereign individual yeah. mm. who should be primarily responsible for everything in your own life. And yes, how we should help each other. Mm. There can be real leadership amongst people mm. but there should never be an assumption of we have this hierarchy between mm. the 40 figures and the rest of us must follow always be and i mean another rich american said this when someone knocks on the door and says hi i'm from government and i'm here to help right. you should always be very skeptical <laughs> Ronald Reagan a ter- said terrifying that. sentence yeah. in the english language yeah. yeah so never 
if someone says I'm here to help, I'm from government or whatever political organization, immediately say, hey, mate, wait a minute. I'm, <laughs> I'm not sure about this. Yeah, yeah. and I, I think uh, we have a short announcement, but if you guys have anything else to add on to this uh, episode, um, well, I, just, time I, to do so? I, I just wanted to uh, agree with you guys. Like, it's. Um, I think I, I one of the things that a, a, a friend of mine said to me was this um, well, you hear this thing from the EFF mostly, but uh, also other parties mm. where they talk about uh, the black child and you know, right. the black child this, the black child that. Black man, you are alone. <laughs> yeah. alone. Well, it's, it's not quite the same thing, but uh, well, when when they talk about the black child, this is it's so infantilizing. Incredibly. I, I, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a... It's like, a, talk about disempowering. Exactly. And that sort of thing. The, the, the implication there is that you can't do anything for yourself. Whatever you do, you need massive amounts of help mm. and from the people with guns, the government, mm. because, you know, the people mm. who are running it look like you, so mm. obviously they're going to be on your side. Yeah. So that's the only thing I wanted to say. Yeah, they, yeah. they need to infantilize the, the, the subject group, because, yeah. I mean, that's all, in the West, they can't get away with that so easily. But always, it's a, what about the children? Yeah. yeah. Like you say something in favor of freedom, then they're like, "Yes, I agree with you." But what about the children? Mm-hmm. We, we yeah. must think about the children. Yeah. So, like this this thing about infants, youth, mm. babies, that's one of the big motive, uh, expanding factors for government yeah. power. It's, mm. Maybe if someone could come up with the concept of, uh, I don't know, childness or whatever, <laughs> like uh, comparable to blackness. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, geez, that would, wouldn't be surprising. <laughs> Anything to add, Chris? Um, I just, yeah, I, again, the broad point of government inf- infantilizing people, especially people for whom they say they want to help. Um, but the, the help always comes in the form of taking from others yeah. to give uh-huh. to others. It's never of those people building up for themselves. It's very much that sort of redistributionist yeah. kind of thing. And you see this when, when governments grow bigger and bigger. It's a, it then becomes a case of group versus group yeah. because the resources become more and more limited. Yeah. So they have to compete with each other. Uh, and then it's the, the tenders, the state capture, that whole idea. So don't be surprised that we see rising social tension in the country because now different groups, call it race groups, income groups, interest groups, big corporates, they have to compete for government favors to get ahead. Mm-hmm. Um, and that to me, these all, everything we've talked about in this episode and what we try to reinforce a lot, it shows you that, that, I, that broad idea that it's just going to keep on getting worse and worse and worse as government control increases more yeah. and more and more. No, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, just a short announcement. Um, so the annual Africa Liberty Forum hosted by the Atlas Network, we uh, at the Free Market Foundation hosted the one in 2017. Mm. Uh, that's coming up next week. It's being held in Nairobi, Kenya. And uh, a few of us here from the FMF are speaking there. Some of us are receiving training there. Um, so it's... Uh, I. I I don't know if it's going to be recorded. I hope it is. Um, and if so, I would encourage you to uh, to please be on the lookout for it. Um, I think it's it's very important for Africans specifically uh, to start getting around, getting together around the topic of liberty and then mm. freeing ourselves from uh, despotism, government, authoritarianism. And I think this is very good because I think this is the third or fourth African Liberty yeah. Forum, and it's, it's a new developing thing, and it's great. Mm. And uh, if it ever comes back to South Africa, mm. viewers, I would encourage you to please be on the lookout and, and uh, attend that. Um, yeah, and that's... that's oh, Martin, just yeah. for the record, uh, you guys are, are going to this thing not to for liberty, not to canvas places to escape to. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, Kenya does look nice this time of year. It's true, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so, um, yeah, that's about it. Uh, it's been a longer episode this week, but I think we had a lot to cover. Um, uh, please subscribe to our YouTube channel, as always. Um, it's the big red button right under this video. And uh, finally, when I say video, I mean a video. Let's hope YouTube doesn't make the button purple like that. Uh, means, yeah, that would be unfortunate. Uh, make it, make it uh, libertarian gold, please. Uh, uh, please f- uh, follow us on Twitter. That's at FMF South Africa. Uh, like us on Facebook, that is Free Market Foundation South Africa. And uh, always remember to visit our website at www.freemarketfoundation.com. And thank you very much for viewing this this week. And we'll see you again next week, probably from Kenya. But uh, we'll see how that works out. Cheers. <laughs>